The hope, I think, was that my older brother and I would become lawyers, mm -hmm. and then he would quit his job, and we'd have, you know, I guess Rosenfeld, Rosenfeld, and Silverman, or maybe Rosenfeld, <laughs> Silverman, because he's my older brother, and then Rosenfeld, I don't know, but, <laughs> but he didn't go to law school either, Okay. Uh, so all of that evaporated. <laughs> Welcome to episode number 44 of the Rose Bros Podcast, where the idea is to connect with other entrepreneurs, athletes, and cool people in general to help you learn a thing or two and provide a little entertainment along the way, all the while enjoying some smooth Rose Bros coffee. This episode, we are joined by entrepreneur Lou Rosenfeld, owner of Lou's Performance Center. Lou's provides boot fitting services as well as high performance ski equipment, including everything from skis, boots, and bindings to footbeds, boot lifters, and everything else in between. In short, Lou specializes in adapting ski equipment with the knowledge of biomechanics and modern pressure balance measuring tools to properly set up skiers. Lou has also published numerous articles and academic papers on everything from the science of boot fitting to avalanche transceivers. Lou graduated from the University of Calgary with a Master's of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering, as well as graduating from the Oregon Institute of Technology with a Bachelor of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering. It was an awesome episode as we talked about Lou's roots in the United States, being a Vietnam veteran, becoming an entrepreneur in the ski industry, career paths, the science behind boot fitting, race car driving, and what you can do to get the best ski set up for the upcoming season. Enjoy. Lou, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for doing this. I really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, you're welcome. It's my pleasure. It's nice to see you again after all these it's years. It's been a long time. Yeah. You were one of the most popular and infamous, famous ski shops in Calgary. Oh. Did you know that? Well, infamous has... Maybe not infamous, con popular. Connotation, it's, I'm not uh, sure famous. I'm happy with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, well, that's nice to hear. Not infamous. Good. I'm glad we could uh, could help you all those years ago. You used to do my boots when I was a yeah. teenager. Yeah. I think you vaguely it, remember that, but... Well, I remember... I do remember it, and it's interesting, because I've done uh, boots for other now adults yes. who were... Uh, who were just little kids yep. when I <laughs> met them. Yeah. Time flies. Some of them skied up to the national team. So it's it's been very interesting to watch. And one of them is kind of on the B team right now, Alyssa Hill. And so, you did um, her boots. Well, we've been working together for a long time, and we still are. That's cool. Yeah. So it's very neat. But it's 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 hard for me to remember. Time goes by quickly. Absolutely. I, mean, I didn't think I would, uh, you know, I'm American, right? I yep. came here to go back to school. I didn't think I would be staying and opening a ski shop here. Yep. And now it's been almost a third of my life it has been spent in Canada, which was no part of a plan really? whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. So anyway. You went here to go to school. I came here to go to school. What did you take? Well, I'm a mechanical engineer. Right. So I already had a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. Okay. And I came here to get a master's degree in biomechanics. Where'd you go? UC? Uh, UC. Oh. And I was in the human performance lab hmm. and and did work there. And that's <laughs> what actually got me to Canada. Oh, okay. Was to get my master's degree. I had called, I had been accepted to several places in the U.S. Mm -hmm. When I told everyone when I, what I wanted to study, because mm -hmm. it was part of the plan to open a ski shop. Um, getting really? master, yeah, yeah. I wanted to research foot orthotics, and and hopefully some other things directly related to skiing. Hmm. And uh, when I told everyone what I was interested in, I was accepted into the programs, into several programs in the U.S. But they all said I should probably come to Canada and go to the Human Performance Lab. There was more work happening there that I was interested in than there was in the U.S. Hmm. So that's what got me here. Interesting. Yeah. Cheap tuition too. <laughs> you no, know, it was actually. Well, cheap tuition. I I still paid triple. Oh, right, because out of country. Yeah, so out of country is triple what it would have been, mm -hmm. what it was for Canadians. But it was st it was still a whole lot less than the places I was going to go to in the U.S. And the, except the, that I wasn't allowed to work. Okay. So it was kind of a double-edged sword. And the goal was to open a ski shop. All along? yeah. The goal was to open a ski shop. I didn't know that opening the ski shop would happen here. Really? Yeah. You always thought you'd go back to the States. I assumed I would go back to the United States. <laughs> so what kept you here? You Well, opening the ski shop. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I wanted to open a ski shop. 
I didn't, I didn't have a way to plan it out so far in advance. So I could say, well, I'm coming to Canada for three years to get a master's degree. And then when I'm done, I'm going to go back to Aspen or right. wherever it was and open a ski shop. Right. I didn't know where the ski shop would be. I see. And people wanted it to be here. And I didn't know where to do it in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And by then I knew people here. Mm -hmm. So I ended up staying here. Did you always want to be an entrepreneur? Was it more a science-based interest? You know, I don't know. Um, I never was an entrepreneur before. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've done lots of different things, but mostly I had worked for other people. Mm -hmm. No, I think I just, for some... <laughs> Somehow I decided I wanted to have a ski shop. That's cool. Yeah. Did you grow up ski racing yeah. or skiing? I didn't grow up ski racing. I wish I had. Mm -hmm. I didn't grow up in any way that taught me what I wish I had been taught about how to ski. Interesting. So, but I grew up, I'm from Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. but they're skiing all over Pennsylvania and there's a ski area, yeah. actually one of the most profitable ski areas in North America, I think it still is, is just a half hour from my house. Really? Yeah. Which one's that? It's called Ski Round Top. Really? There, yeah, there's, there's <laughs> a, a U.S. demo team member that's from Ski Roundtop, yeah. the general manager yeah. of Fernie. Andy Cohen. Andy Cohen grew up 50 miles from me. I knew that you guys knew each other, yeah. yes. Okay. Andy Cohen grew up 50 miles from me and yeah. skied, at, <laughs> skied at Ski Roundtop, and that's where he started his career. I mean, he, uh, hmm. he, taught t he was a ski instructor there. Did you come to Canada together? Or was it no, no, no. Oh, kind no, of no. I, I think I think I got... Actually, I don't know his schedule. It was he okay. came to Canada before me because he was director of skiing at Black Comb in the eighties. I see. In the eighties, and I didn't get here until ninety seven. Okay, his okay. wife's Canadian. I did just mention to anyone that is listening, we are drinking Rose Rose Coffee here at Moose Performance Center live. So we are drinking Rose and Rose. I hope coffee. you enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, this is good. Well, hopefully, Trevor, it's pretty thank fresh. you. Yep, I usually take cream with mine, but uh, I'll, uh, well, so do I. But um, we'll leave it like this that. Is good, thank you. No problem. You finished school. I and... finished school. Well, I finished school, and I I forgot I wanted to open a ski shop. What was it about a ski shop that you were interested in? Well, I grew up skiing. I mean, there was a ski area a half hour from our house, but I grew up skiing. So the, I think the first time I went skiing, I think I was probably four or five years old, and my mother took me. I remember spending the day. It was a ski area friends of ours owned, so it was it was pre ski round top. It was one of the early ski areas, uh, well, I don't want to say in North America, because I guess it wasn't, but it opened in the 50s, right. and it would have been one of the early ski areas, and it was owned by a group of families from my hometown, and they were all friends of my parents, so my mom took me there to learn to ski, and I, rem I remember being on this little hill. I think she took a ski lesson, so I was left by myself to play. <laughs> yeah. I remember there was a hill. I picture it. It couldn't have been more than six or seven vertical feet. Maybe it was 10. Yeah. You know, I don't know. <laughs> and it was just a place for me to play. And yeah. I remember sidestepping up it or however I got up it and then skiing down. Mm -hmm. And I, rem I clearly remember. I, I don't know how this sticks with me so well. But uh, by the end of the hour and a half, I think, because I'm, I'm assuming my mom was in a lesson. Because yeah. she didn't just drop me off there at five years old and mm -hmm. say, I'll come back and get <laughs> yeah. you when the mountain closes probably wish she could have yeah, yeah well, that, might, that might be but i remember by the end of it i had taught myself how to well i guess we'll call it a hockey stop back yep. then i had taught myself to do a hockey stop i think mm -hmm. i could only do it in one direction i doubt i could actually turn it into a turn to control myself coming down the hill yeah but i could go straight down that little run and then at the bottom pivot my ski sideways and stop mm -hmm. and i remember being super proud of myself absolutely and then uh and then I only skied a few more times and didn't start again until probably junior high school. But Ski Round Top, I mean, it started a lot of people skiing. Mm -hmm. It was well, open at night. Mm -hmm. It opened, I think, skiing started at 9 in the morning. It went from 9 to 5, and then it closed for an hour mm -hmm. from 5 till 6, and then it reopened again from 6 until 10. Mm -hmm. So all through junior high school and high school, I had a season's pass, and we, we went at least a few nights every week for mm -hmm. night skiing. Mm -hmm. I didn't do well in school. <laughs> Good enough to get into university, though. Yeah. It was probably being in the military that got me into university. Really? Yeah. So you did military after high yeah. school then? Yeah, I, I was Yeah, I was drafted. This is Vietnam War era kind really? of stuff, right? So Did you yeah. serve time in Vietnam? I, I was in the, the U.S. Navy for three years. 
Overseas? Mm, well, all around. Really? Yeah. I yeah. didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was going to, I was, <clears throat> this was back when Vietnam was still going on and the U.S. had a draft <sighs> mm-hmm. and, uh, and I was, and it was a lottery. Right. Right. So. Your number got called. When they started, yeah, it was kind of interesting. When they started the lottery, the first year, when it didn't count for me, the first year of the lottery, my number was, I think, 323 mm-hmm. or something, which is like saying, there's no way in it. There's right. no chance you, you're going to get drafted. Yep. And then the next year, the second year, it was in the 200s. And you're then, starting to get nervous. And then the third year, <laughs> which is when it counted for me, it was 75 really? or something like that. So I was going to go to Vietnam for sure. It was at the very end of the war, but the war hadn't ended. So right. I enlisted in the U.S. Navy rather than, rather than be in the Marines or the Army in Vietnam. I mean, that's a whole other topic of discussion. Yep. But you, so you served your time, finished up in the... We shouldn't call it serving my time. That has a different connotation. At, <laughs> least, at least in the U.S. it does. Yeah. In the U.S., it, I don't know what it means here. In the U.S., it means you were imprisoned and you served your time okay. in prison. The Navy wasn't. You probably learned what, a lot and whatnot. It, yeah. Well, I was an electronics technician. Yeah. So I spent a year in, in electronics school. Yeah, it was great. And fin- then I spent two years flying around. So you finished up and then you went to start your undergrad? No. Then I went to work in a ski shop. That's cool. At a friend of mine owns. I was (laughs) supposed to visit him this year, but he's in Montana and I can't get there. So I worked there for five or six years, I think five years. And it was a, it was a boot fitting shop. I learned a lot. Interesting. Although that was the very early days of boot fitting, Mm -hmm. very early days. So a lot of what I learned back then is outdated now. <laughs> yeah, it might even just plain be wrong. Right. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but either way, um, that's when I got started, and I worked there for five years. But in Pennsylvania, the ski season's really short. Mm-hmm. Skiing doesn't start until U.S. Thanksgiving, mm-hmm. so that's the end of November. Yep. And then it's over by the end of March. Right. So I was unemployed more than I was employed. <laughs> so after five years of that and finding summer jobs, I just thought maybe I better... I, I better see. fix this scenario. So then I went and did my undergrad. And then, uh, so I had four years of engineering school. And then I was uh, an engineer for Fuji Medical Systems for seven years. By the time you started your schooling in Canada, old. you were... Oh, by the time I started school in Canada, I was in my 40s. 40s? Yeah. I didn't know that either. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm 67. I think you just paid me a compliment. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So you finished up school in Canada and opened the ski shop. Was that, so you were happy at that time. Was it a bit of a risk opening a ski shop? Did you have to take a big loan? And Well, I couldn't get a loan. Okay. Because, well, because I wasn't Canadian. First off, I'm not sure Canadian banks are real friendly to people trying to start businesses. Yeah, I would agree. It's not easy at all mm-hmm. to get money from a Canadian bank to start a business. Mm-hmm. It's much easier in the U.S. Is at it? least it was. Right. I don't know what it's like now, yeah. but it was much easier. So, no. I guess it wasn't a risk from that standpoint because I couldn't borrow any money. You didn't have any debt. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, there wasn't, any, there wasn't anyone to talk to. So, so what would you do? Well, a friend of mine loaned me... $5,000. And, and I started the store. In Calgary. Yeah. And I think probably where, where I used to fit your boots. In Boness. I, in Boness. Ah, well, okay. in Montgomery, but on Boness Road. Yeah. In that little store. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. That's yep. where, next to Felix's. Well, he loaned me $5,000 for a year or two. I kind of lived in the store. Yeah. I mean, I used to sleep there because I wasn't making enough money. The first year the store was open, I think we grossed either twenty five or $35,000. Wow. That's gross. I had to pay rent out of that yep. and everything else. So not much left for rent. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can really be in the coffee there industry. Wasn't much it's not easy. Yeah, yeah. Um, you were 30s, 40s at this point. So. I was 40s. I was in my 40s. I would have been almost 50. So I think I remember you saying your dad wanted to be a lawyer originally. I bet at that time he well, was bugging you. my dad was a lawyer. You. Right. So was he bugging you, telling you to go no, back? No, no. That was never going to happen. <laughs> um, I mean, I never went to law school. Yeah. The, the plan, I, I think, from my dad's standpoint was that my older brother and I would become lawyers. Yeah. And my dad was, uh, was the head of the legal department for a kind of a mid-size, well, York Air Conditioning. So it's a mid-size U.S. company, but it's the world's largest air, commercial uh, air conditioning company. Pretty good job. So, yeah. yeah, it was a pretty good job. 
And that's where he worked his entire life. And he was on the board of directors and a bunch of other things. Yeah. And uh, the hope, I think, was that my older brother and I would become lawyers. Mm -hmm. And then he would quit his job and we'd have, you know, I guess Rosenfeld, Rosenfeld and Silverman. Or maybe Rosenfeld, <laughs> Silverman, because he's my older brother. And then Rosenfeld, I don't know. But, <laughs> but he didn't go to law school either. Okay. Uh, so all of that evaporated. What did your brother do? My brother owned a retail store. He studied business in university okay. and then moved to Oregon. So that would have been in the 70s. Moved to Oregon right out of school. Worked planting trees and whatever for a year or two. That's and, cool. And, and eventually Oregon, being what Oregon was back then, found his way to working in a leather shop. And then the leather shop became a retail store in a very cool little town almost on the California border. Okay. And eventually he became the manager of that, of that leather shop, which then became a more substantial retail store. And in the 80s, he bought the store hmm. and he just retired from it last year. He's owned it for 40 years. Interesting. Yeah. So no lawyers, but at the time, no so lawyer. you were probably a little bit stressed getting the business going. Was it Lou's Ski Shop then or Lou's no, Performance Center? It was, uh, no, it was Lou's Ski Shop. Okay. It was Lou's Skiing Performance Center. Yeah. You were just scraping by. Did you think to yourself, maybe it was time to try something else or no, was it just... No, I, I was here. I was here and it's what I had committed to. So if I was going to do something else, I think it meant I would have just moved back to the U.S. Right. I, w was, I wasn't even a landed immigrant here at the time, right? I, I don't think so. I think I was still here on a work visa. Have you ever heard of that guy from the Northeast of the States? He started, sort of, it's a bit of a tangent. He started a bunch of ski shops and now he's a billionaire. He's a fanatics guy. No, I don't know him. Oh, okay. I, kn I know the name of the oh, company. Uh, he was, anyways, I'll have to get back to you. I okay. I if I find my phone, but it just reminded me of that story. So well, I haven't, I, I'm not a billionaire. <sighs> yeah. But, well, maybe you are. I don't know. But, but, <laughs> yeah. but, but I'm glad the shop seems to have a good reputation. Yeah. Thank you for that. You weren't thinking to yourself, it's time to go to do something else. Well, it was a little late for that. I was already in my 40s and had, well, almost 50 and had switched careers and, uh, and gone back to school. And, and uh, yeah, there, there wasn't time to, to bounce around anymore. Right. I guess I, <laughs> um, I was an engineer for seven years for, well, for Fujifilm. But I abandoned that and I was offered jobs back in the medical industry as an engineer, but I didn't take those. I had one that would have had me as a director of engineering at another medical, another medical radiology company that was based in Salt Lake City. Okay. That might not have been a bad thing to, uh, to do. I like Salt Lake, yep. but, but anyway, I didn't take that. So no, I, I wasn't, I wasn't going back. Business did pick up eventually, obviously. Well, yeah. it picked up really fast. I mean, for all those years, you know, it's kind of like, when I used to play racquetball, mm -hmm. it was the fastest growing sport in North America. Right. But you can say that about everything that ever comes along. It's easy to right? look back, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so every year, the store doubled in volume. You but, can't keep doing that, but it's no. easy to do when your first and second and third and fourth year. Right. You better do that, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah, the store was growing fast as can be, but it still was a long way from making money. And that was the 90s. That was... Um, no, I started my degree in 97 and finished in 2000 and I opened the store in 2002. Okay. So it sounds like it was kind of more of a, just a passion or interest rather than spotting some sort of market opportunity. Well, I didn't know any market opportunity because I didn't know where I was going to open the store. Right. Right. I mean, it would have been nice in hindsight maybe to say, oh, there was an opportunity in Big Sky, Montana or yeah. something like that. Yeah. And it would have been easier I mean, to go back to the U.S. and I would have been able to get bank loans. I would have been able to do a lot of things I couldn't do here. But, uh, but at the same time, I didn't know anyone there. I knew people here. People wanted me to stay and open the store. Mm -hmm. When I was at the lab, you know, I met some coaches. I met some local skiers. I knew some people in town. Mm -hmm. I helped with research on binding position. Oh, yeah. And that was for a man who's, who's an investor in the store now. And his son was, well, how old? His son was possibly skiing with you, Blake Loudon. I'm 30 now. Yeah, Blake would be older than that. Okay. But, but Blake was, <laughs> I mean, he was hoping to make the national team. And okay. we did some work with him at the lab on binding position. And his 
dad and mom are still good friends of mine. So did you approach the business more from a scientific viewpoint or was it a business 100%? Well, I don't have a business background. Yeah, that's what I mean. I mean, I wish I did. Okay. Right. It might be, I I don't want to say it's more important. In many ways, it, it's probably more important. But you've always been really methodical and technical with your work, right? Like well, I'm technical with, with the work because I'm an engineer. Yeah, exactly. And, that, and that's the approach I have. Yeah. And, and the idea, my thoughts, my thinking has always been that there's, there's a lot more to skiing well or should be than just buying a pair of ski boots and a pair of skis and going skiing. Mm. And there's a lot you can do with equipment set up that helps people that helps people ski right. just just like just like the top tennis players in the world or the top golfers in the world yeah. don't use clubs that they buy at the label at the yeah. local sporting goods store right, right? Mm-hmm. there's a lot that goes into it there's <laughs> a lot that goes into it right yeah. there's a lot you can do to make equipment help you do your sport better hmm. and and that's the same with skiing so that's always been something i th- that i agreed with that's the approach i've taken at the store the, the research I was connected with at the, at the lab, my research was on foot orthotics and human adaptation. Yeah. But we also did research. I also helped with research at the lab on binding position. That was for Atomic. And then before I opened the store, I did go back to the U.S. for one year to work for a, a boot fitter there who taught me quite a bit. Mm-hmm. And, and we did more research there, and that was for Nordica on binding position. Hmm. So I brought all of that stuff with me here thinking that that binding position is an important part of equipment setup and other things, you know, related to that so that there was more we could do than just sell gear. And that's how that was. But your question is about... Which way did you view it? Was it kind of a science experiment or as a business? Well, it wasn't a science experiment so much because I'd already done the science, right? And I was, I, I, I knew what I, I knew what I knew and I thought I was confident in the way things worked. But your question was also about business background. And yeah. for people that are thinking of opening a business, man, I think it's more important to have a business background. Yeah. But everyone says you can learn business along the way. It's better to well, be you technical. you can learn either way along the way. Right. Either, I mean, you can learn your craft along the way and improve on that, or you can learn business along the way. Yeah, that's but what I But mean. I would say you're, you're running a business, and there's a lot to running a business. I see. And, and most businesses fail in the first four years, yep. right? And it can't be because, well, it could be, but probably it isn't because people don't know their craft. It's because maybe, maybe I mean, maybe people don't have enough money to, to support them in growing a business. Right. Maybe a lot of things, but it could also be because maybe they don't know enough about running a business. Mm-hmm. So um, it's great to have a business background. Really? It's important. So what percentage do you think the business versus technical or what portion honest, is more important? I, I don't have a percentage in mind, but but you don't have to be an engineer to do the things I do in the store or to learn. Really? You know, you can be a ski instructor and learn. You can be a lot. You can bring it. I mean, mm-hmm. you have to be able to understand the technical background and the way to problem solve and all of those things. But you don't have to be an engineer to be able to do any of that. Well, you don't need to be an engineer to do any of that. I happen to be one, right? But but it's more because that's just the way my mind works, yeah. right? And yeah. I mean, I like problem solving. It's it's a scientific, it's it's a science based process to yep. me. Problem solving, and you start here and the scientific and, and, method, and, and, yeah. and you go step by step, and you look at the obvious stuff, and and you rule some things out, and you rule some things in, and eventually, hopefully, you arrive at the right conclusion, and that's the way I approach things. So I think that's how I end up being an engineer. Maybe I also end up being an engineer because, you know, I don't, in the U.S., maybe lots of families. I mean, if you're going to, at least back then, you're going to go to university, you're going to either be an engineer, doctor, or lawyer, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's a lot of other things you can do, Mm -hmm. but but your parents would say, (laughs) boy, we would love to have a doctor, an engineer, or a lawyer in the family, right? Mm -hmm. And I... I could do math. Mm-hmm. I like math, so I might as well be an engineer. Yeah. I mean, it, w- it was kind of, there There was no thought process involved in me going to engineering school. It was more like, well, I can do that. Right. Why wouldn't I? Were there any experiences, books, classes that really taught you the most about business? Not many. Not. I mean, I, I haven't, 
you know, mostly I've learned by doing experience and, and by being lucky enough, I guess, to, to not make so many bad decisions that I'd go out of business. <laughs> but there, I mean, for sure, there's been people that have helped me along the way. Okay. Our head rep and head, meaning the company yep. head, has been tremendously helpful. In a business sense. In a business sense. In helping me understand what to order, how to order, what, I mean, just incredibly helpful. Hmm. And then, and then. Experience. <laughs> and then, well, experience, but also I, you know, I, I said, we had some friends that have loaned me money and helped me get started, and they're all local business guys. So, yeah, there's been places I could go to and, and people I could ask questions and people that have helped. And I, I guess at the time, well, not at the time, I hope still, but, you know, we were serving a need here. Mm-hmm. So people wanted me to succeed. Mm-hmm. So we've had, I mean, we've had customers that have been customers for 18 years now it's nice to to have a loyal following i think it's it's important Mm -hmm. especially in in a business like this one where i mean different from your business if people drink coffee they they come see you every month or Mm -hmm. however it's recurring revenue right right and that's (laughs) That's great that's not in skiing (laughs) right i mean it's recurring but maybe it's recurring every three or four years sometimes yeah so it's nice. <laughs> it's essential to have people that think you did a good job the first time right. and remember you when they need to come back again because yeah. they don't need to come back very often. And it's, right? it's a business that involves a lot of inventory too. I mean, I, I would imagine. a lot of inventory. So you took loans and nowadays do you find it, is it cash flow or is there still big loans involved? Or? Well, I, no. That would scare there, me. <laughs> there, there, are big, there are big loans involved, but, but at this point now it's from my suppliers. Oh. Uh, right? So... That would be intimidating. You, you get to the point where you don't need a bank so much anymore because your suppliers are loaning you money. Oh, I see. And I mean, they're not directly opening their wallet, so to speak, and saying, here's $50,000, Lou, go put it in the bank. Right. But they're sending me fifty dollars or $100,000 of inventory that I don't have to pay for for four months. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If it weren't for that, I mean, that's bikes, that's everything. Yeah. If I had to pay for everything... The minute uh, it arrived right. here, I I, right. how do I have that much cash? Well, so, yeah. Yeah, okay. I'd need a half a million dollars of cash sitting here in September just to open yeah. a store each year. <laughs> yeah. And that, that doesn't happen. Right. So, so you have to get to a point somewhere where somebody trusts you enough to say, okay, we'll send you some inventory and you can pay for it in 30 days. How important do you think trust is in business? Well, it's everything. Yeah. Yeah. It's everything. If if companies wouldn't do that for me, I wouldn't have a, a business because I'll never have that kind of cash just laying around casually. Yeah. Right. That's we yeah. start the ski season, we start setting up the store. This year is different than other years because of COVID, but normally we would have things arriving in August or September. Yep. But we don't have substantial sales until well into November. But meanwhile, there's. I don't know, maybe a half a million dollars worth of inventory sitting here. That's stressful. <laughs> yeah. So so all of that inventory, not, none of it got paid for when it was shipped. Right? Well, that's good. None of it. From your perspective. Well, it's essential. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's essential. So, so it all sits here and then hopefully hmm. the season progresses and people arrive and, and I earn enough to pay it all off. Using your technical background, have you ever been able to apply that into product improvements or any like proprietary stuff? Most of what I do, uh, I haven't, I haven't taken much time to do that yet. That would seem like a gold mine if you could. Well, we, we've talked about starting a boot fitting school. All of the things I have, um, an old product that is, I hope arrives next week that the company went out of business a long time ago. Okay. But I think it's a really good product. So I bought an old one, actually from the ski shop I first started working at. And it's, I hope, shipped this week or next week. And we'll look at it here and see if we can manufacture it and see if there's still something to do with it. So there's a bunch of things like that. There's some binding things I would do, but it's not so easy because changing binding setup runs into huge liability issues. So I haven't... (laughs) taken the time to look at that much but there's we've made a few products we've done a few things but i get busy enough here that i've stayed in the store and not done much with product development i mean intellectual properties 
Huge. There, there's all kinds of things I could do. I've, I've stayed focused on the store, and but I'm 67 now. As I, you know, move away from the store, hopefully in the next few years, then we'll see what else I do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe there will be some manufacturing. Maybe there will be some other things. Have you ever thought of a second store or a third no. store? No. Really? Well, it's too late. I, I, I don't... I, I mean... Yeah, my goal isn't to work until I'm 85. No, right? okay. So some people they that's, some people do that, yeah. and I would like to be busy. Right. I'd like to have something to do until I'm that old, but I don't want to have it being um, 40 hours a week of responsibility for a store and other people's lives yeah, and all sure. of those things that come with it. So I wouldn't mind working here for a long time. I'm still really healthy. Yeah, I would like to not have all the responsibility. <laughs> yeah. So we'll see. We'll see where that where that gets me. I used to race sports cars. My best friend still races. Really? Yeah. And he's racing at a very high level. What kind of cars? Well, I raced the Datsun 510. Okay. He now races prototype sports cars. Huh. So he's racing at, at, a, at a professional level as an amateur. Maybe he'll go back to, he'll get involved with that. I would, <laughs> well, I had my race car here and then the track here closed down years ago. And there's been talk for years about opening another track, and it hasn't happened. Hmm. So finally, I gave up and and sold my car. I just finished that F1 series on Netflix. Have you seen that one? No, I don't. I don't follow racing at all anymore. Okay. Uh, I, I every year I I think when someone says I just watched an F1 race, I think I should be following. Okay. But but I I just don't. Lance Stroll. I don't race anymore. My friend is 2,000 miles away, I see. and he's doing some racing in Europe and other things, and I, I just don't have a way to okay. to do all of that. And so I haven't kept up with it. If, if the track opens here, I bought an old Porsche three years ago, and, cool. <laughs> and I bought it as hoping it would get to be a track car. Yep. Not a race car, but a track car. Okay. So we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. How has COVID been for your business? Well, I don't know for sure yet. I've heard that all the outdoor sports are exploding right now, and biking, and you were saying that. They're all exploding. They all exploded. I mean, bikes were incredible this year. Yeah. The ski shop is busy this year, but it's also made, made things very, very difficult. It hasn't made it necessarily better. Really? Well, first, because we headed into this year knowing not what to expect. So... I couldn't say in March, because we closed yeah. in March, right? Mm-hmm. Normally, we would have closed in May. Mm-hmm. So we lost 20 or 25% of our revenue last year. So there's no way to say in March when we closed, well, next year's going to be wonderful. Yeah. It, it was, that was impossible. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> so everybody, not just me, every ski shop cut their orders, right? Because I, I, I thought, well, maybe I'll have a business next year, but if I order... Yeah, for everything sure. I did last year and it doesn't sell, I'm going mm-hmm. to go out of business for sure. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. everybody cut their orders. The manufacturers manufactured to what we ordered. So there isn't anything in the supply chain now or very little. And now we're in the fall of 2020. So now we're in the fall. The store is very busy, but shipping is horrendous. There's things that should have been here a month and a half ago or two months ago. And they still aren't even in the country, much less at my store. Wow. And they may not get to the country. And there's things I want, and the company's already completely sold out. Really? And, and, and we didn't order enough, so it's, it's going to be interesting. We'll end up, I mean, if everything continues, but it's impossible to know that it will right yeah who, who knows yeah maybe, they could shut the hill down again, yeah maybe right? <laughs> in december they close skiing's over yeah so right now we're very busy so it looks like we'll have a good year but i don't know how to sit here and just say we will mm-hmm. and at the same time i don't know that we'll have enough inventory i mean just because i mean if stores are 200 percent ahead that means they need a hundred percent more inventory right well it isn't available so you can be selling stuff at this high rate, but if you sell out... That's it. That's it. You're done. <laughs> really? It, it, yeah. The, there's nothing more to sell. That's what happened to bike shops, right? I mean, they, they did really well, but they could have done even much better, right. but they ran out of stuff to sell. And we're already out of things to sell in terms already? of being able to order more. Oh, I see. And meanwhile, there's things that haven't arrived yet. So when you walked in the door, I was talking to 
my manager and, and the, the shop manager and yeah. we're still waiting for stuff. Yeah. And it's coming in so late that, that the store is super busy now when normally we would be setting up the store when there's no customers here and we'd be relaxed. Yeah. Now we have 40 hours or more a week of people wanting boot fitting. And really? at the same time, we have to check in all, all the inventory and get it priced and get it out. So, hmm. so we're doing two jobs at the same time when normally we'd be doing them separately. We'd be having inventory arrive in September when there's hardly any customers. And then as we got it all done, we transitioned to, the, okay, that job's done. Mm-hmm. Now we have customers. But instead, we have customers and setting up the store happening at the same time. Really? Yeah, it's very busy. There's a lot to do. Well, you're busy. saying that I shouldn't go to Louise this weekend. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. You, should go to, you should go to Louise. Louise is a great hill, just it, for it's anyone a listening. Great yeah. hill and, <laughs> I'm just being busy. I mean, it's a phenomenal start to the season. Yeah. So yeah. you should go. I am fortunate enough to be able to go on weekdays. But if I was if I wasn't and I had to go on weekdays or on weekends, yep. I certainly would still be skiing just as much. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I, you know, I started skiing here on on weekends because I started skiing at yep. Lake Louise in local areas when I moved here for my master's degree. And I remember clearly going to Lake Louise with friends of mine and on the weekend mm-hmm. and thinking, "This is amazing. Yeah, this hill isn't crowded. Look at all the space there is to ski." But that's because what I compared it to is where I grew up, it which eased. was just mob, yeah. just mob <laughs> on a weekend lift lines. Where I grew up skiing, lift lines on a weekend would be a half hour, 45 minutes long. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So and we'd ski as singles yeah. just yeah. to help get through the line, right? And that was never necessary at Lake Louise, even when it was crowded. Really? Because the lift line was never more than a few minutes. But I'm used to lift line being a half hour, 45 minutes. Yeah. So I'd ski at Lake Louise and think, this is amazing how empty this is. Look at all the room there is to ski. Yeah. Now that I get to ski on weekdays, yeah. I, think, <laughs> I think weekends are crowded. Yeah. But well, they are at Louise. They are crowded. On yeah. me, but, and they would be at Sunshine and everywhere else. Yeah. But I wouldn't ski any, any less. Do you think skiing is becoming more popular? Is it just more people that live around Calgary now? Well, if you're talking about the industry overall for years, skiing isn't growing. Really? If you're talking about this year, there's a ton of people coming back to skiing. Just like last summer, a ton of people decided maybe they'll start riding bikes again, even though they hadn't been on a bike in 20 years, maybe. So now there's people coming back to skiing because, I mean, the safest place to be is outside. And, uh, and, and I mean, we had someone in yesterday just saying, well, normally this time of year, we're already in Arizona for the winter, right. but we can't go. So, and we're outdoor people, so we're going to start skiing again. Okay. So they came in and bought a bunch of ski gear. So, so it's, it's busier because there's just more people then. There's more people that, that don't have, that don't know what, they need something else to do with their time. I see. Whether it continues, yeah. you know, next year, if those same people can go back to Arizona, right. I assume they will. So we'll have to see that whether this is a blip or, or, or how much it can, you know, whether it continues in the next year. But, yeah. So why do you think Louise is busier nowadays than it was back when you were younger? Well, don't forget when I was really young, I mean, I was still in Pennsylvania. Yeah. So I don't know that Louise is any busier. Uh-huh. I'm saying the difference for me <laughs> is the difference between skiing on the weekend right, and right. skiing on a weekday. Oh, okay. I okay. don't know what it's like. I mean, right now, if it's busier this year... It's because a big chunk of population is here instead of being in Arizona or, you know, wherever everybody went. Everybody is here. I was supposed to be in Montana this summer on a rafting trip and that was canceled. Right. So, okay, now I'm doing something here. Yeah. And everybody, virtually everyone who 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 would have left here in the wintertime and gone to Arizona or Florida or wherever they go is here. So either they're going to sit at home all day long yeah. or if they want to do something, well, the winter sport here is skiing, right? Either they're cross country skiing or they're alpine skiing or they're alpine touring, but they're all coming back to skiing again. Which is good for you. <laughs> it's great for me. But but it will for all the questions about business, it will mean that next year when we start ordering for next year, it's hard. I'll have to look at this year and say, well, let's see. Yeah. Is the shop really this big or is it only 75% this big? 
because all of these people are going to quit the sport. Right. <laughs> right? They did it this year. Um, they didn't spend any money over the summer because they couldn't go anywhere. So they have money laying around and they yeah. could easily buy new gear. Um, what happens next year? How do we order for next year? That's where the business part of all this comes in. Do you think you may run out after Christmas? Oh, we're going to run out of stuff. I, well, it, it depends on COVID yeah. and whether the uh, hills so stay open. Yeah. But if the hills stay open... You're going to run out. Yeah, we'll run out for sure. So what are you going to do? There's nothing to do. Oh. I guess I'll get to go skiing. Shut the store down. I'm, well, we won't shut the store down. But but it'll be just like bike shops didn't shut the bike shops down because there there's still service to do and there's still bikes around. Right. But we'll be out of some stuff. Yep. For certain. So if we'll be out of some things by Christmas, right? I don't know wow. what exactly yet, but but there are things like one of the companies whose electric socks we sell and mm-hmm. electric gloves we sell, they're already sold out. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we have inventory. But but we don't have any more inventory than we had last year because that's what we ordered. And you're sold right? out in November. Well, we're not sold out yet, but they are. Oh, I so see. So I'll sell out because because we don't have any more inventory right. than we did last year. Right. But it seems like there's fifty more fifty percent more people buying stuff. Yes. The company is sold out. So once I sell everything I ordered, yeah. I'm done with that product because there, there's no more to get. Hmm. So electric gloves, they'll sell out for certain by Christmas. <laughs> Heated boot bags, yeah. they'll sell out. And those kinds of things because there just won't be enough. Have you noticed an uh, increase in online orders with the COVID and whatnot? Well, we don't sell online. Yeah, have you ever- I know there's, there's an increase in online period. Yeah. Right? Fortunately, it... Amazon's it, gone crazy. It, it maybe affects me to some degrees less than other stores because people come here for boot fitting service I see. and they can't get that online. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times when they buy products online, especially ski boots, they end up not being the correct size and they don't fit right. So there's a lot of issues around that. Right. So I'm not sure we're affected exactly as much as other stores are, but we're affected for sure. We're affected to the point that for the first time uh, we're charging a sit down fee, hmm. which we never used to charge. Yeah. It's always been free to come in here and get sized for boots and chat about boots because right. most of the time we ended up selling boots and we still do most of the time, but there for certain are now people that come in and, and want us to measure them and I want see. to go through the process. And then they walk out of the store right. with our recommendation and then they go to Amazon and shop. Right. So now this is a first year in 18 years. Now we charge $50 to sit down. That's smart. And if you want to chat, we'll chat. I'll do, I probably, I won't do it here, but I've done that like Mac. Yeah. So, <laughs> to be honest. so we'll, we'll, well, yeah. So now we charge $50. If you buy boots, you get yeah. the $50 back. But if you just want to pick my brain mm-hmm. and then go somewhere else, then yeah. that costs you $50. That's fair. Yeah. 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 I think it's fair. It's, it's all we can do. You work a lot of, with racers. We have. Do you take a lot of learnings from the racers and apply them to day to day? Actually, it'll surprise you, but probably not. Really? It's it's no. If anything, it's the other way around. Really? Yeah, because cause it's too technical with the racers. No, it's the opposite. It it it's from from most coaches' standpoint. There is. And this would be ski instructors too, but there's an absolute right way to do to do things. Okay. I don't, I'm not explaining this well yet, but th- there's it's, a lot of there's a lot of things we've learned about binding position and other things that aren't necessarily applied at the ski racing level. Young coaches don't learn it; they have to stay coaches for a long time before they learn it. So it's hard. It it it's easy for me to talk a recreational skier, it's easy for me to say, you know, I think you should move the bindings forward a centimeter and a half. Yeah. And then they go out and try it. And if it works, they say, great, done deal. Yeah. Right. That's easy to talk a a racing kid into doing that and going against what their coach advises. Really? And it is much more difficult. It's more the other way around. I mean, we Mm. do have athletes that we work with like the, the girl I said, you know, had skied mm-hmm. up to the B team. Mm-hmm. 
the year she was named to the, to the national B team, she was skiing in the binding position I recommended rather than the binding position from the manufacturer who she skied for. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we've done <laughs> that with other athletes, but it's not easy to accomplish. Mm -hmm. It's a constant fight because there's someone else in the middle. It's the coach, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and they're not going to, right. Nobody wants to be in a position of saying, well, Lou told me this. Mm -hmm. And the coach says, well, I, I don't think Lou's right about that. And this is the way we're going to do it. So they're just going to say, well, I'm going to do it Lou's way. Mm -hmm. Right. But, but with a recreational skier, they get to make any decision they want. Mm -hmm. Right. So if I say, I see. let's try a different binding position really? and they go try it and they like it. That's that's all there is to the decision process, right? I see. So do yeah. you take the race for work because it's, it's business or is it super interesting for you? Or? It's interesting for me, but but we don't do anything with a racer that we don't do with recreational skiers. Uh, we just do a lot more, honestly, with recreational skiers. Right. When it's interesting is to have a few athletes who really want to test yeah. and will try things out regardless of their coach or maybe with their coach's blessing, mm -hmm. you know, one of the girls we're working with now is one of the top U14 girls in the country. Hmm. What makes it easy to work with her is that her dad is a coach. Hmm. So he's on board. Mm -hmm. He's her coach. Mm -hmm. So, so when we talk about a testing program for her, it's straightforward, hmm. right? Cause he's Absolutely. part, he's part of the process. He's already bought in. That would seem obvious. Yeah, but but it isn't necessarily obvious. I mean, not every coach has the time. I mean, they have seven athletes, not just one, hmm. right? So they have to sort all these things out. They have to hmm. sort a testing program out. They have to run a testing program maybe just on a Sunday while they're working with other athletes. It's not so straightforward and easy to do. With her, it's easy hmm. because her dad is her coach. I see. They're together all the time. That's why Ferrari and Mercedes have their F1 teams, isn't it? One of the big sure. reasons. Sure. They take the learnings from the racing and apply them to the... Or is that an urban would, legend? Is that, I, I would I argue know. that, yeah, but it, it's also possible there, there might be more to learn in F1 than there is in ski racing specifically. Really? But, well, I mean, there's a... <laughs> there's a ton of technology in a car, yeah. right? That's why it's so I cool, mean, yeah. Just a ton. There aren't smart skis, right? There aren't... Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, there are some. Head has yeah. done some work along that line. And Marker was doing some work a while ago with electronic bindings. But but it certainly isn't Not yet. to the level that, that a car is, right. right? I've always found that super interesting, the relationship between high-performance stuff and then kind of day-to-day -day and the advancements. Oh, there's a lot of things. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Do you think there's a lot of room in skiing for improvements in that well, sense? I think what there's a lot of room for is is the kind of work we've done with binding position and other mm -hmm. setup that there's a lot of misinformation about. And the misinformation is is kind of along the line of assumptions, right? So the assumptions, because most people treat the sport as recreation, mm -hmm. right? It's not competition. No. <laughs> so, so they buy a pair of skis and they go skiing, right? right? So the assumption is that the binding position that's marked on the ski by the manufacturer is the only right position for bindings on the ski. Right. And that's wrong. Yeah. But, but that's the assumption. Interesting. So the assumption is that some engineer designed the binding position in, mm -hmm. and it has to be the right position for everybody. Well, I mean, that isn't even sensible. We don't approach anything else that way, right? Mm -hmm. You don't, we don't approach golfing that way. We yeah. don't even approach even if you race a bicycle or, or ride a lot, we don't even approach fitting your bicycle that mm -hmm. way. You know, you, you buy your bike and then maybe you yeah. buy a new handlebar stem because you need longer reach. Or yeah, you, yeah. I mean, you change all kinds of things. Right. Um, but with skiing, we say there's where the bindings belong and it doesn't matter if you're yeah. 6'2 with a size 28 <sighs> foot or you're 5'8 with a size 24 foot. We're going to treat you you two as if you're exactly the same person and that's a problem it's a problem yeah it, it, for me it's a problem other people think it's the way it's supposed to be so huh. so there's room i think to do a lot to help people ski more easily mm -hmm. and and enjoy it more interesting but it isn't i, I don't know how many people 
run the experiments I, I recommend. Right. You know, there's a, a lot of skis on the wall there that all have movable binding. And, and we talk about moving the bindings and finding out whether you like a different position. But not many people do that. <laughs> but I don't think many people do that. Now, we did a podcast this summer with Tom Gelly. He's a ski instructor from New Zealand. Okay. okay? Yeah, he told me about and that. And he, yeah, yeah. he's, I, I think, to compare it in Canada, I don't know the New Zealand association levels, yeah. but in Canada, he would be, I think, a level four course examiner. Right. So right? good, yeah. Yeah, so good skier. And, and high up in, in, in ski school or in the ski association. So he and I did a podcast. He skied for vocal for years. Hmm. We did a podcast. He wanted to talk about binding position. That's what we talked about. Mm -hmm. and, and then he said, this is really interesting. I've never played with binding position in my life. <laughs> I just thought, yeah. you know, this is where it is. And I've just always skied there. Yeah. And, and so I just talked to him just a couple of days ago um, now because, you know, he's had the season. Mm -hmm. and, and I asked him, you know, what did you do with all the binding position things we talked about on the podcast? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, I've tested and now I've moved my bindings forward a centimeter and a half. Hmm. Well, he's skied for 40 years or whatever at using the factory position. And now he's decided that yeah. the skis he skis now ski better <laughs> a, a centimeter and a half forward. But he's a high level instructor and he never did any of that before. Hmm. Right? It's not to criticize him. It's just to show yeah. how people treat the sport. Right. Have you seen certain racers along the way really embrace that mentality and succeed? Well, sure. I mean, the I, I don't like Manny without permission. Like that, yeah. I can't <laughs> use anybody's names here, but yeah, the woman we had on that skied up to the B team, then she tore her ACL. Hmm. But before that, that year, the year she was named to the, to the team, she was skiing her bindings three centimeters forward on her slalom skis. Wow. That's huge. Yeah, that's unusual to have to move it that far. But she had a great season. Hmm. She dominated, and she was named to the B team, and she was three centimeters forward. I remember Bodie Miller used to be famous for tinkering with all his stuff. Tinkers with all kinds of stuff. Yeah. I sat down with, I had a poster of him here, famous. He just retired a few years ago. Canadian or? No, no. Oh. Uh, I, I think either Swiss or Austrian. Okay. And, and I had dinner with him years ago. Uh, he skied for head. Hmm. And he talked about how he did his own boot fitting for years. He traveled with all his own boot yeah, fitting tools tinkered. because it was so necessary to, yeah. to make his boots work properly yep. that, that, and he couldn't get help otherwise. So yeah. he, he bought a whole setup of hydraulic, yep. hydraulic uh, tools and, and he traveled with them all the time and he worked on his boots all the time. Right. So it's, it's really important. I remember I rode up to live with Bodie once and he, I was on a pair of skis and he, and he told me he designed them. He'd since moved to Atomic, but he's right. like, I remember when I designed those Rossies, you're on, and I couldn't believe it. Yeah. I mean, it just gave you a sense of how much time he put into all it. The, all the gear that that they use it at the national team levels is is so different, and the rules they follow are completely yeah. different. Right. Right. When we did, when we did the first research for Atomic, uh, that would have been, I think, 1999 or something like that. Yeah. When we did the first research for Atomic, I was the only one in the research group that had worked in a ski shop. Hmm. The, other, the other researcher skied, but he had never worked in a ski shop. Yeah. So he didn't know how bindings were mounted. He didn't know the mechanics of it. So I was the one that, that was talking to the director of design with Atomic and all of those things to, to learn all the rules. Right. And, and when we had those talks, I said... And I talked about this with Tom Gelly as well. But, you know, I said, how, how do you choose the binding position for your recreational skis? And he said, well, we design our skis and then we send them out with a bunch of ski testers to ski on them. Right. And we kind of have a meeting. And, and I'm paraphrasing now. But, you know, <laughs> yeah. we sit down and, and we experiment with binding position. And then we have a big meeting and we pick the binding position based on everybody's feedback. Hmm. And, and then I said, well, how do you do it for your national team skiers? And the answer was, well, we start with ball of foot center of running surface, and we don't have to talk about that particular technique now. But basically, that's where we start. And then each individual athlete tests from there and chooses their own position, hmm. right? So, so it's unique. The, the position is unique to the athlete. Yeah. 
right? Yeah. And, uh, and then years, years later, so this is about how ingrained assumptions are. Three years later, or two years later, whatever it was, when I was doing more research on binding position for Nordica, yeah. at that time we were doing the research at Snowbird. Hmm. And, I, and I was sitting on the lift with a woman who was a U.S. national demo team member. Yep. So one of the top women skiers in, in the United States. And, and we rode up the lift together and I had been working in Snowbird for the whole year. <laughs> and she said to me, I hear you're doing all this research on binding position now. And, yeah. And she said, you know, I don't believe in any of that. And she said, when they design the ski, the engineers right. determine the binding position and that's where you have to ski it. Well, so here's a woman that's been skiing for 40 or 50 years and is one of the top skiers in the country. And it's pretty short sighted. And everything she's telling me is exactly the opposite <laughs> of what the manufacturers are telling me. And they're the ones paying for the research. So, you know, who's right and who's wrong. Hmm. But, but that's the beliefs. And, and that's, that's one of the problems, mm-hmm. right? So, um, I think Hersher was really uh, known for his, he knew his skis so well. Marcel Hersher, that, that was the rumor. Everybody in bindings at, at the level of, of national team. Yeah, they're all they're especially Hersher or Bodie Miller or the top skiers in the World Cup. They're skiing on skis that are unique to them. Yeah, but right? that just shows how important it is. Well, it's it's everything. Yeah, or it's not everything, but it's 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 essential. Yeah, you know, I sat in on uh, on setup for Thomas years ago. And Thomas Grandy, Thomas Grandy, yeah. and I think I'm right. I want to be careful here because I didn't see the whole thing, but we were setting up a pair of boots. I say we. I was just along for the ride, but I'm fairly certain he had a pair of boots for slalom and a pair of boots for GS, and they were set up differently. Yeah. Right. Yeah. At that level, things are very different than at the recreational level. There's a lot of the, you know. There's a ton of testing. Yeah. And we don't do any of that. And, and there isn't, and you don't need to spend as a recreational skier, you don't need to spend all your time testing your gear. No. But, but I think it's important to understand that some things can be changed, like binding position, mm-hmm. and you can easily test that mm-hmm. and, and, and learn a lot and then maybe find something that makes skiing easier. Why do you think certain, for example, Atomic, why do they seem to stand out year after year? They seem to be one of the premier race brands. Is there some reason that you think? You know, I honestly don't know. Okay. I mean, Head would say they are. Or right? Head, right. They've seen so, them. Move. Yeah. So, and Vocal would say they are. I, To some degree, I do mean, they, to some degree at the national team level, it's a matter of, I don't, I don't know because I don't get to ski on those skis. Okay. So I don't know if if head builds the best ski or or head builds really good skis and has okay, a lot of money to spend on right. on hiring the best athletes. Good signing agents. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, does Ferrari build the best Formula 1 cars or does Ferrari build really good Formula 1 cars and have enough money to sign the fastest right. driver in the world? So kind of like Red Bull sort of thing, right? They, yeah, yeah. So I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't know where to. So I, I don't know that Head absolutely builds the best race skis in the world. I honestly think it's probably unlikely, huh. um, because skis are so similar at the racing level. They're they're very similar yeah. in their construction, right? We have all kinds of techniques to um, that are used on recreational skis yeah. because we we're marketing to recreational skiers and we can use some of those differences right. in advertising, right? We build the lightest ski, we, but, but, but none of that happens at the race level, yeah. right? We just build skis yep. that we advertise win. So did the skis win or did, yeah. or did Hersher win? Yeah. Right. So hmm. it's, it's a little more interesting. It, it's harder to figure out. Right. Okay. Certainly though, there's a lot of testing. Mm-hmm. I mean, these guys travel with tons of skis, yep. different base grinds, different waxes, different binding positions, who, all kinds of things are different. What I think is, is the message for me isn't whether what's important isn't who makes the best skis. It's just that they test lots of different things. And as a recreational level, we don't test anything, mm-hmm. right? So we do go demo skis. And, and then from all our demos, we pick the skis we like the most 
And what we think is that the difference between the skis is some design difference. Like if I pick, if I pick Rosie, it's because I like that ski skis better for me than any other. It's personal. What we think is that the ski is really the same and we're picking the best ski. Where really what we're picking is the ski that, that mounts their bindings a centimeter and a half forward so the ski feels quicker. And if we picked Rosy overhead, let's say, if we move the bindings a centimeter and a half forward on the head, it's possible we'd like it as much or even more than the same Rosy right, we picked. Right. So there's a lot of, we assume we're just testing skis, right. where we're testing skis, but we're also testing the tune on the skis. We're testing the binding position on the skis. We're testing the ramp angle of the bindings and a whole bunch of things people don't even think about. And then we're testing the fact that it's a bright, sunny day today and the snow is really good. And you feel good, yeah. And you feel good and you had a really good day. Right. And, and when you tested the other ski, it was minus 25 and, and really icy and, and, you, and you just, you didn't have a good day. So we're not, when you, when you demo skis, you're not for certain demoing exactly what you think you are. You think you're just demoing a ski, mm -hmm. but you're not. You're demoing all the changes in the system that are possible. That's why I think people demo skis, and in the end, for certain, they pick a ski they like. But is the demoing system that everybody uses really mm -hmm. the, the best system? It's not. It's possible people pass by the best ski because the snow was good that day. Okay. I mean, when I get to demo skis... We're going to test skis on Monday, but I'm going to test skis, seven different pairs of skis, all on the same run on the same day. Everything's fairly repeatable. Whereas when recreational skiers test skis, they're going to take a ski and they're going to go to Lake Louise on one day. And then three weeks later, they're going to go to Fernie on another day. And mm -hmm. everything about testing is so varied, you know, who knows how valuable it really is. You will for sure pick a ski out of that that you like. Actually, you probably will. But I did have a woman years ago who spent the whole season. I mean, she spent the whole ski season testing skis. So she had skis she didn't really like because she was only skiing every few weeks. And she wanted it, she it took her all season to test. So starting in November until April, she was testing skis the whole time. She spent the whole year skiing on skis that she wanted to replace. And at the end of the year, she came back to me and said, I don't know what I want to buy. I'm completely confused. Yeah. And she's confused because she can't compare the skis. The variables are right? the same. Yeah. Well, the variables are all over the place. Yeah. You know, one day it was sunny, one day it wasn't, different ski area. And then, and then the tests are three weeks apart, so she can't even necessarily remember what she liked or didn't like about each skis. Hmm. So at the end of the year, she didn't, <laughs> all that testing, she didn't, she wasn't <laughs> able to buy a pair of skis. Sort of the magician, not the wand sort of thing, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Would you have any advice to someone out there kind of? Well, I to? think, I mean, other ski shops do this. We do it. I think the best thing, it, honestly, is to find a shop you trust, mm -hmm. understand that they have tested skis. I mean, that's what we're doing Monday next week. We'll have Head and Stuckley and Rossi and Blizzard all there at the same time. And the whole staff is going to ski together mm -hmm. on the same runs. And we're going to test skis back to back to back. And then when we sell skis... We guarantee what we sell. If I recommend a ski or any of my staff recommends a ski and you buy it and then come back and say, you know, I don't like it, we just either give you your money back or give you another pair of skis. Hmm. And I, I think that's honestly a better way than demoing endlessly and then trying to compare mm -hmm. skis when the snow is different. Mm -hmm. and the, it's just really hard. I know how the skis ski. If I ask you the right questions... I'll be able to figure out what's important to you. Mm -hmm. And and since I ski the yeah. local ski areas, and you do too, and I know where you ski at those ski areas, I know what the terrain is typically like. I know what's valuable. I can turn that into a ski recommendation. Right. And hopefully I get it you know right more than I get it wrong. <laughs> yeah. and, and you'll be out immediately, instead of waiting months to test, you'll be out that next day on a new pair of skis. You can leverage the info. Yeah. yeah. If I get it right... Instead of testing all year and waiting, hoping they go on sale, and then they go on sale, except that the size you want and the ski you want is already sold out, mm -hmm. you get to immediately turn it into a pair of skis. 
Well, I think that's a great place to leave it, Lou. That's I, a place uh, to leave it. I really appreciate it. Sure. Uh, for anyone who's listening, that's a great plug to come down to Lou's and Perfect. get your skis checked out, your boots, your bindings. Favorite place to ski before we end it. What would be your favorite ski hill? My favorite ski hill. There's so many places I haven't skied. But my favorite hill of everywhere I skied is probably Big Sky Montana. Okay. But I like Lake Louise a lot. And although there's lots of good skiing around here. All right. I mean, Fernie and and Castle and, and Kicking Horse are great ski areas, but they're just far enough away yeah. that I don't get to go to them for a day. So mostly I end up at Lake Louise, which isn't a bad thing. No. No, it's not a bad thing. There's great terrain there. That's where I do most of my skiing. Well, thanks, Lou. I really appreciate yeah. your time. We'll, uh, no problem. Thanks we'll for the coffee. Up there. Very nice. I hope you enjoyed it, the Rose Rose Coffee. Yeah, yeah. Has, good uh, luck with, with your business. And, uh, and thanks for this time. Thank you. Hey, thanks for listening, everyone. Hopefully you enjoyed the episode. If you liked what you heard, check out rosebros.ca where we will have upcoming shows. You can also find our coffee and chocolate there where we plant one tree for every bag or bar sold through our partnership with One Tree Planted, a cool not-for-profit organization focused on global reforestation. Until next time, happy coffee drinking.